Today, we're talking about Mr. Beast finding himself in three different scandals, Andrew Tate even piling on. Lizzo has now responded to those disturbing allegations in the lawsuit. Microsoft just keeps dropping the ball. We've got grandmas fighting back, kidnap victims, punching their way out of prisons. We're gonna talk about all that and so much more in today's brand new extra large Philip DeFranco show. You daily dive into the news, all powered by this upcoming August 7th drop at beautifulbastard.com, where if you jump in on the first day, your order will be 30% off. So buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. Starting with this new story is horrifying. So the sex worker in Seattle gets approached by a potential customer last month. It begins like any ordinary service. They have sex. She's expecting to get her money. But then he reveals himself to be an undercover cop with a gun, police patches, a taser, which he also points at her and other law enforcement equipment. With him then putting her in handcuffs and leg irons and throwing her in the backseat of his car, saying, you are under arrest. And then they start driving to the station, or at least that's what she assumes. The thing is, though, she realizes this trip is taking a strangely long time. And then she looks at the officer's cell phone and she sees this map that says they're still two hours away from their final destination. Destination. So it's at that point she realizes, oh no, the guy in the front seat is not a police officer. And in fact, the place that he's taking her, Klamath Falls, Oregon, is more than 450 miles or about seven hours away. And along the way, he allegedly stops to assault her, then just keeps going. Eventually, though, they get to this man's home and he takes her into the garage. And sitting there like a low-budget horror movie is a cinder block dungeon this man apparently built himself, with him forcing her inside, then locking a metal door at its front and then leaving her there. But thankfully, this guy was as much of like a, an architect or a construction worker as he was a cop, because the woman was actually able to break out of his dungeon. And the way she did that was by repeatedly punching the door until her fists were bloody and the welds on it broke, with her then pulling down the metal screen material and climbing through the opening to the outside world, with her then able to run out, flag down a motorist who called 911, and then she was taken to a nearby hospital. And now, police have actually tracked down the suspect, 29-year-old Nagasi Zabiri, and they found him in Nevada with his wife and kids. And they arrested him after a standoff in a Walmart parking lot. When they searched his Oregon home, they found this handwritten note titled Operation Takeover. And on it, it had bullet points like, leave phone at home and make sure they don't have a bunch of people in their life. And in fact, the FBI says that it's now linked him to violent assaults in at least four different states and has reason to believe there could be several other victims. With the Bureau even saying they believe that he targeted sex workers or roommates in California, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Utah, Florida, New York, New Jersey, Alabama, and Nevada between August of 2016 and July of 2023. And then Mr. Beast is taking shots from seemingly everyone right now. The first fight stemming from that Mr. Beast burger endeavor. We talked earlier this week about how he was suing his ghost kitchen partner a virtual dining concept, with him saying that they ruined the quality of the product and its efforts to rapidly expand. And well, now, VDC is hit back, sharing a statement with Gizmodo claiming that Mr. Beast's lawsuit is, quote, riddled with false statements and inaccuracies, and even going as far as accusing Mr. Beast of tarnishing the brand in favor of his own greed, saying Mr. Donaldson recently attempted to negotiate a new deal to serve his own monetary interests. When VDC refused to accede to his bullying tactics to give up more of the brand to him, he filed this ill-advised and meritless lawsuit seeking to undermine the Mr. Beast burger brand and terminate his existing contractual obligations without cause. And according to BBC News, BDC will be filing their own claims against Mr. Beast now. Right, but that's just one of the fights. The other being posts going viral saying that Mr. Beast is a scab. Or with people saying that he was just given a middle finger to the actor's strike. And that, because as it turns out, he voices a role in the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. And he just posted on his Instagram stories promoting it, saying, I'm in a movie, check it out, LOL. Tagging the film's official socials using its hashtags, as well as one noting that the post was sponsored by Paramount. And so with that, you had tons of people saying he was a scab for promoting the movie made by one of the studios actors are on strike against. With a lot of those posts blowing up, but then you had Mr. Be saying, this isn't what's happening. Responding to one post, false, this is a contract I signed pre-strike and was legally obligated to promote. This falls under the exceptions they have outlined. But adding, regardless, to make my support clear, I'll make a donation later tonight. And if you look into it, he's absolutely right. Because while promoting work for struck companies is not allowed during the strike, there are various exceptions and gray areas to some of the strike rules. And in SAG's FAQ for influencers, it states, if an influencer is already under contract to promote struck work, then the influencer should fulfill their work obligation. Right? So it's a different situation. And when you had people trying to compare what was happening here, it's a, like, like the Oppenheimer cast leaving the premiere when the strike was announced. That is in no way a one-to-one -one comparison. But then finally, the third of Donaldson's issues this week involved Andrew Tate. With that, stemming from a tweet Mr. Beast sent out last month after various creators learned that they'd be paid by Twitter. With Mr. Beast announcing, whoever has the most liked reply to this in 48 hours gets all my Twitter revenue for the next month. With Tate replying to that, saying that if he won, the money would go to his Tate Pledge charitable efforts. With that, racking up 280,000 likes. Now notably, that's not the most liked reply. One person simply responded with a period and got over half a million likes. Well, yes, those are the current stats. Reports also show that the tweet still had way more likes than Tate's tweet within the time frame of Mr. Beast's competition. But still, you would take complaining, saying he thinks he should be the winner in writing Mr. Beast this week. Hungry children are waiting. Though Twitter even having to add a fact check to know that Tate did not win the contest. But still, you would Tate doubling down, saying the other tweet shouldn't actually win, and writing, this is a lie. They bought it a random tweet after I won. They refuse to donate to Islamic countries. Refuse to help innocent children. Refuse to help the world. They only want to push the agendas of Satan. Also with this, it should be noted that you have people saying, you know, this account won. It's not random like Tate and his supporters are making it out to be. It's an account that has 
has nearly a million followers. It regularly gets a lot of likes on its tweets. So yeah, I guess just uh, another average day for the most popular YouTuber in the world. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. And then Lizzo is denying the allegations three of her former dancers recently levied against her in a lawsuit. But yesterday we talked about how they accused her of body shaming, creating a hostile work environment, sexual harassment, and way, way more. With some of the details just being jaw dropping. But in a social media post this morning, Lizzo called these claims false and outrageous. Saying it's disappointing that her work ethic and morals are being called into question in writing. These sensationalized stories are coming from former employees who have already publicly admitted that they were told their behavior on tour was inappropriate and unprofessional. Adding that she takes her job seriously, which means she has high standards, and sometimes I have to make hard decisions, but it's never my intention to make anyone feel uncomfortable or like they aren't valued as an important part of the team. But also adding, while she doesn't want to be looked at as the victim in this situation, she also doesn't want to be painted as the villain, saying she's always been open about expressing herself, including her sexuality, but will not allow people to weaponize that against her and turn that openness into something that it's not. Writing, there is nothing I take more seriously than the respect we deserve as women in the world. I know what it feels like to be body shamed on a daily basis and would absolutely never criticize or terminate an employee because of their weight. And in response to this, we've seen a lot of love, but also a lot of anger. With some of the anger being connected to multiple news outlets citing Marty Singer as her lawyer. With Singer's previous clients, including men who have been accused of sexual misconduct, like Bill Cosby and producer and director Brett Ratner. While the Los Angeles Times noted that he's had other celebrity clients free of Me Too allegations like Scarlett Johansson, a number of people think that hiring him is just a very bad look and it actually makes Lizzo look guilty. Though again, at the same time, if you look on her Instagram post, there's a lot of support there. With one person writing, I've known many people and other artists who have worked with and for you, and I've never heard anyone say anything but fantastic things about the energy and working environment they experienced. I'm hoping and praying all of this clears up soon. Some writing, they're mad they were fired and trying to get money. Couldn't be more obvious. You'll be fine. But for now, we're gonna have to wait to see what comes from this legal battle, though, in the meantime, the court of public opinion moves forward. Which is why, again, now that Lizzo has responded, I pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? And then, some grandmas out there are just built different. One of those grandmas is 87-year-old Marjorie Perkins. Because she's in the news because one day she woke up in her Brunswick, Maine home at two in the morning to find a teenage boy wearing neither pants nor a shirt standing over her bed. And she recognizes him as the kid who once mowed her lawn 10 years ago and maybe he's like 17 years old now. But this time, in the dead of night, he's looking to do more than just cut her grass. He allegedly says he's going to cut her. With Granny Perkins saying, I thought to myself, if he's going to cut, then I'm going to kick. And so she starts putting on some kicking shoes and this little twerp starts wailing on her. They're reportedly grabbing a nearby chair to block his attacks, also trying to yell out the window for help but in the dead of night no one hears her. Meanwhile, the boy is pushing and punching her, even leaving a bruise on her forehead. But she's returning fire. She kicks him and eventually she says he gets tired and he ends up retreating to the kitchen and that's when she sees his apparent entry point. A window where the AC unit had been but was moved out of the way with his clothes and a knife piled up next to it. And so she follows him into the kitchen and at this point she realizes I gotta, I gotta calm this situation down. She reportedly tells him he needs to get out, that he needs to get help, but then she says that he said he was awfully hungry and hadn't had anything to eat for quite a while. And so she says, well, here's a box of peanut butter and honey crackers. You can have that whole box. And gave him two containers of Ensure and gave him two tangerines. And so then, while Fucko's munching away on some late night snacks, Marjorie goes and picks up a rotary phone, like an actual rotary phone. And she, you know... <laughs> Dials 911. With a guy leaving before the cops end up arriving, but they quickly track him down with a police dog and arrest him. Them then being charged with burglary, criminal threatening, assault, and consuming liquor as a minor. And as far as Granny Perkins, she's being hailed pretty much across the board as a badass motherfucker. And even more so because even though this insanity happened, she doesn't want any sympathy. With her telling one outlet, don't cry about it. And then, did you know that two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time that they're 35? Or maybe you have that friend or that family member that's dealing with hair loss, and well, thanks to the sponsor today's show, Keeps, you don't have to just sit around and wait for that to happen to you. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just take better care of the hair that you have, Keeps has you covered. Keeps helps you stop hair loss before it's too late with a scientific and affordable approach to treatments that are up to 90% effective at reducing and stopping further hair loss. And in addition to clinically proven treatments, Keeps has an award-winning all-natural thickening shampoo and conditioner system. And you can get these products delivered directly to your door, meaning no more going in person to the doctor's office for your prescription, saving you both valuable time and money. Hair loss stops with Keeps. So to get your special offer, just go to keeps.com slash DeFranco or just click that link in the description. That's keeps.com slash DeFranco. And then Governor Greg Abbott is killing people. That's what many Democrats in Texas are now saying after Mexico's foreign ministry reported yesterday that a body had been found along the floating barrier of buoys in the Rio Grande deployed to prevent migrants from entering the United States. With the foreign ministry saying in a statement that the cause of death and nationality of the individual are unknown. And according to the the director of the Texas Department of Public Safety, preliminary information suggests this individual drowned upstream from the marine barrier and floated into the buoys. Also, a spokesman for the department saying that the body was found on the side of the barrier that's within Mexico's borders.
reporters and that Mexican officials have recovered it. And this news is a big deal because it marked the first time a death had been reported along the barrier. And the reason I said marked and not marks is that just hours after the first body was found, Mexican officials reported a second body was found in the river about three miles from the first one. And like the first body, as of recording, officials have not yet publicly identified the cause of death. With the Mexican Foreign Ministry saying, we reiterate the position of the government of Mexico that the placement of chained buoys by Texas authorities is a violation of our sovereignty. We express our concern about the impact of the human rights and personal safety of migrants of these state policies, which run counter to the close collaboration between our country and the United States federal government. And all this coming as Abbott's new buoy barrier has been the subject of widespread controversy and criticism, with many alleging that not only is this tactic inhumane, but it's also illegal on multiple fronts. And in addition to Mexico's repeated claims about violations of sovereignty and treaties, Abbott's buoys have also now become the subject of a lawsuit from the U.S. federal government, which we talked about last week. But still, Abbott has continually refused to remove the buoys. And it currently seems that he's unlikely to do anything unless he's literally ordered to. And even then, he's probably going to fight that decision. And then there's a massive shakeup happening in Wisconsin right now that could totally change the entire state. Because yesterday, a group of liberal organizations filed a lawsuit asking the Wisconsin Supreme Court to throw out the state's GOP-drawn legislative maps and create new ones for 2024. And the timing of all this is incredibly significant. Because it comes just one day after the state Supreme Court of this battleground state officially flipped from a conservative majority to a liberal majority for the first time in 15 years. And that thanks to the swearing in of Justice Janet Protasiewicz, who repeatedly argued during her campaign that the Republican maps were rigged and should be reviewed by the state Supreme Court. And the reason this is so massive is that if the liberal groups win their case, not only would the map get redrawn, but every single seat in both the state assembly and Senate would be required to have elections in 2024. And that includes Senate seats that were not supposed to be up for re-election next year. Now, notably, the lawsuit does not challenge congressional maps, just the districts that determine the state legislature, but it would totally reshape Wisconsin politics as we know it. Because for more than a decade, Republicans have had an insanely powerful majority in both the Wisconsin State Assembly and Senate, thanks to former Republican Governor Scott Walker. He drew maps that strongly favored his party. And since then, Wisconsin has made what many describe as some of the most aggressively drawn partisan gerrymanders in the country. Like, for example, in 2018, even though Democrats won every statewide race and more than half of the statewide legislative vote, Republicans still won 63 of the 99 state assembly districts. So it was clearly a ridiculous map. But the crazy thing is that it got even worse after it was redrawn following the 2020 census. With the Republican legislature, which again, had such a big majority because of its own gerrymandering, approving a new map that was very similar to their previous one, but skewed even more in the favor of their party. Now that map was vetoed by the state's Democratic governor, Tony Evers, which sent the matter to the then conservative Wisconsin Supreme Court. And although the justices initially chose a new version of the map that Evers had submitted, the conservative U.S. Supreme Court tossed the Democrats map in an unsigned opinion. So the Wisconsin Supreme Court just adopted the Republican map that Evers had previously vetoed, which how odd for some unknown reason the U.S. Supreme Court was totally fine with. And by unknown, it's known. Or because as expected, that map helped Republicans cement their majority in the state legislature even more, with Republicans winning two-thirds of the state Senate seats and almost getting a veto-proof majority in the Assembly. And again, this despite the fact that Democrats won races for governor, attorney general, and secretary of state last year. And that's on top of almost winning a U.S. Senate seat. And that whole situation is a key part of this new lawsuit, which argues that by enacting a bill Evers had vetoed, the Wisconsin Supreme Court violated the state constitution, which guarantees the separation of power and the governor's authority to veto bills. Beyond that, the plaintiffs also allege that the map violates the state constitution Constitution's equal protection principle and its protections for free speech and free assembly. Also claiming the map is unconstitutional because it has districts that are not contiguous, which is when a single district is drawn to include areas that are not all geographically connected. Or so basically two unconnected neighborhoods could be a part of the same district, but then the neighborhood that connects them is part of a different one. But with all that said, as far as what happens next, the groups behind the lawsuit are asking the Wisconsin State Supreme Court to take the case directly instead of having the matter work its way through the lower courts. And if this new liberal majority decides to take it up, we could see a decision pretty soon. And then Microsoft is in some trouble right now because both China China and Russia managed to use vulnerabilities in their products to hack the U.S. government. With the most recent hack being announced by Microsoft yesterday, that involving Russian hackers linked to their foreign intelligence service, and they reportedly used Microsoft 365 accounts to trick Microsoft team users. By using their compromised 365 accounts, the hackers set up official-looking technical support-themed domains and sent Teams messages to a ton of people directing them to fake websites. And once there, they'd be asked to log in and grant approval on their Microsoft multi-factor authentication app. But in reality, it was just the hackers who needed that authentication code to get access to the target's account. And once in, they had full access and used it to access sensitive information at various global organizations and even U.S. government agencies. And all that would be bad enough on its own, but it comes just a few weeks after the news came out that China also hacked U.S. agencies using Microsoft accounts. With this time, the Chinese getting access to Microsoft's cloud email service and compromising hundreds of thousands of emails, including those of the U.S. State Department and Commerce Department. And while the unfortunate reality is that a company getting hacked by foreign intelligence agencies isn't something that's, like, shocking, in this specific case, you have people furious because there are accusations that Microsoft just ignored basic cybersecurity principles that made the hacks 
works way easier. And on top of that, there are claims that Microsoft's just trying to cover up how much they actually fucked up in preventing these hacks. With, for example, multiple security experts and agencies claiming they actually told Microsoft there was a serious flaw in Microsoft's Azure, which is a product that allows organizations like the US State Department to manage user authentication. However, according to these reports, despite knowing about the flaws, Microsoft did nothing, which allowed the hackers to steal login credentials and authentication on the fly, giving them essentially permanent access. And so the fact that Microsoft seemingly knew that there was an issue and did nothing has gotten the attention of some politicians, with this including Senator Ron Wyden, who in a recent letter to the FTC and Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, accused Microsoft of having a history of covering up its failings, like back in 2020 during the infamous SolarWinds hack. Even after that, it continues not to follow basic cybersecurity safety practices. Things like using a single skeleton key that when inevitably stolen could be used to forge access to different customers' private communications. But as of right now, it's unclear if any action is actually going to be taken against Microsoft for seemingly ignoring the warning. And it also doesn't seem too worried, having brushed off the criticism and saying that it's just part of the constantly changing cybersecurity landscape. And then, should big tech companies pay news organizations for their content? That's a question that's been dominating international headlines for the last couple of days. And a lot of this starting yesterday in Canada when Meta announced that they'll be blocking all access to content and links posted by Canadian news publishers on Facebook and Instagram along with international news links. And with this move, Meta's making good on their threats in response to Canada's Online News Act, which notably requires big tech companies to negotiate with and pay news organizations for their content. Supporters of it argue that the act is meant to save the faltering news industry in Canada, saying that major platforms have taken up the majority of advertising revenue, arguing that with the dawn of the digital age, hundreds of news organizations have been forced to close and that saving those that remain will require money from big tech platforms. But Meta, obviously not happy with that and not agreeing, saying that posts with links to news articles make up less than 3% of posts of a user's Facebook timeline. Also saying they offer news organizations over $170 million in free marketing from clicks they provide. But right now we're seeing Canadian lawmakers standing firm, saying that they need to set an example for other countries considering similar legislation. And their heritage minister saying to Gizmodo, Canada is standing up to Facebook for the right reasons. Facebook is trying to send a message not only to Canada, but to other countries like New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and the United States. We're going to keep standing our ground. Also, even though this is the biggest right now, it's not just meta in the news. The company formerly known as Twitter is in hot water over payment to news outlets, with specifically one French news agency filing a lawsuit against them, saying Elon Musk's company is refusing to negotiate payment terms for the agency's news content. And there you actually saw Musk echoing Meta's sentiment in response, writing, this is bizarre. They want us to pay them for traffic to their site where they make advertising revenue and we don't. But also, according to an EU copyright rule that France adopted in 2019, by law, social media companies must pay publishers for certain types of content. But for now, with this ever-changing landscape, we're gonna have to wait to see what happens. And then, oh, it's summer. There's so much to do out there and everyone deserves to have some fun. Whether it's concerts, baseball, the NFL season's coming up, theater, there's always an event happening for any mood, distraction, or taste and entertainment. So why would you let the summer fun pass you by? Because thanks to a sponsor of today's show, SeatGeek, you don't have to. And even better, you'll get $20 off just by using my code Phil for tickets. So treat yourself. You deserve it. And with over 28 million downloads, SeatGeek is the number one rated ticketing app. And with Taylor Swift, Zach Brown Band, and Bruce Springsteen all on tour right now, you need SeatGeek. And they don't just sponsor the show. They are my actual go-to. Whether I want to go to a little comedy, an LAFC match, or I mean, even the Super Bowl. I just tap into the SeatGeek app and SeatGeek wants to make sure that you're getting a good deal. So when you're on the app, look for the green dots. Green means good deal, red means bad. And every ticket is backed by their buyer guarantee and SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. And remember, that is $20 off your first purchase with promo code Phil. Just make sure you click that link in the description to download the app. And then, you know, a lot of people have bad credit, but even more people are finding out they have bad credit because they were actually screwed because of unpaid medical bills for medical care they didn't even receive. And unfortunately, you may be a part of this group right? because what we're talking about today is medical identity theft. And that's defined as the act of stealing someone's personal information and submitting fraudulent insurance claims without your permission. We're talking about situations where you're footing the bill for someone else's medical care. When that bill comes into the mail, it can lead to a lot of confusion, just like it did with Evelyn Miller, a 63-year-old retired healthcare administrator. With Evelyn receiving a text message reminder about an appointment in Atlanta that she never scheduled, she was confused, right? She had moved hours away from that area. She hadn't used the hospital in question for years. So Evelyn, she waves this message off like it's spam. But then she receives a phone call detailing diagnostic results from the ER visit, which again was for a visit she did not schedule or go to. And then she was quickly hit up with a $3,600 bill. So then she goes to the hospital's billing department only to receive very little help. And so finally she reaches out to the privacy office, writing, I think there's something going on that someone is using my information and the visit and the charges appear to be fraudulent. But Evelyn is also kind of an outlier. She spent years working in hospital administration. The average person, they're probably not going to be as lucky and get this situation handled until long after the theft takes place. There's also notably two different kinds of medical identity theft. Often, it's someone using a lost insurance card or some other ID to receive medical care on someone else's dime. But other times, it's not a malicious stranger. Sometimes, medical identity fraud happens between friends and family. They even refer to this as friendly fraud, like knowing that your uncle has a higher copay than you do, so you loan him your insurance card to go to the ER. In fact, according to a study done by the Poneman Institute, nearly half the people who fail to report medical identity fraud said that they didn't report it because they knew the person who used their identity. But also, in some cases, medical identity fraud can happen on a larger scale, where the personal identification 
patient data of over 11 million HCA healthcare patients across 20 states was exposed earlier this month. And unfortunately, they weren't the first, right? These types of breaches affected 52 million patients in 2022 alone. And the largest health breach in history was the exposure of nearly 80 million Anthem records in 2015. And unfortunately, the number of breaches of security in healthcare, whether by hacking or just simple IT problems, they've been on this upward trend over the last several years, which poses a serious risk. And according to John Regi, the National Advisor for Cybersecurity and Risk for the American Hospital Association, personal information in exposed medical records can be sold in bulk. And the people buying that information? Criminals who use fake providers to file hundreds of millions of dollars in insurance fraud. Or they even use the information to open credit cards and apply for mortgages and loans all in the names of unsuspecting victims. With John saying they flee with the money and the individuals left to deal with it. And all of that can be so catastrophic. With Eva Valesquez, President and CEO of the Identity Theft Resource Center, a nonprofit that provides free assistance to victims of identity theft, saying, the majority of victims find out when they're trying to move on with their lives if bills have gone to collections. And those unpaid bills in your name, they can stack up and impact your credit, causing you to get denied for loans and mortgages. But it's not just the financial impact that the victims have to worry about here. If your medical data is tangled up with someone else's, it can prevent you from getting necessary medical care. With Velasquez explaining, sometimes people can't get their prescriptions if their records are mixed with someone else's. Maybe you won't be able to get the treatment that you need. There are serious implications. And all of that's on top of the exposure of your other personal information, like your date of birth, social security number, your address, with the only remotely maybe kind of okay news being that at least medical identity theft is relatively rare compared to other identity fraud. With the Federal Trade Commission receiving just over 27,800 reports for it in 2022 compared to the over 400,000 for identity theft related to new credit card accounts. Also, with us talking about this, we should talk about the ways to handle it when it does happen. It's easier said than done, but keep your eyes on any bills that you receive from insurers and medical providers. And if you see something suspicious, contact them right away. You can also go to the FTC's identity theft site to learn your next steps and file a report. Also, it's recommended you ask every medical provider that may have been affected by the fraud for your medical records and work with them to fix any discrepancies, along with notifying their fraud department and sending a copy of the FTC report, as well as just keeping an eye out for organizations like the Identity Theft Resource Center, which again offers free assistance in recovering from many different kinds of identity theft. And Velasquez is saying, it's best to proceed as if your data has been compromised and will be for sale. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And then, it's too damn hot outside. You've got people in Arizona getting severe burns because they just fell on the pavement, which was scorching. The ocean water in Florida is the temperature of a hot tub, and hundreds of wildfires have been raging through Greece. Right, those are just some of the many side effects we're seeing of this historic heat wave. A heat wave that was in fact so big that scientists declared that July was certain to become the hottest month on record even before it ended. And the European Union's Copernicus Climate Change Service putting out a report showing that July is on track to break this record by a landslide. And understand, we're in this situation where global average air temperature records are usually broken by like a hundredth of a degree, right? Maybe a few of those. But the first 23 days of this July averaged 62.51 degrees, which is over half a degree above the previous record set in 2019. And while the data tracking for this only goes back to 1940, scientists believe that these temperatures mark the warmest the planet has seen in 120,000 years. And so now you have 2023 on track to potentially be the hottest year on record displacing 2016. And all of this could just be a sign of what we're going to see in the years to come. With the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization explaining in a statement, the extreme weather which has affected many millions of people in July is unfortunately the harsh reality of climate change and a foretaste of the future. The need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is more urgent than ever before. Climate action is not a luxury, but a must. The Secretary General of the UN echoing those concerns, also going as far to say, and it is just the beginning. The era of global boiling has arrived. And like I briefly mentioned, we're seeing the impacts. Right, like in Phoenix, Arizona, they had a record-breaking 31 consecutive days with temperatures above 110 degrees. And that heat leading to emergency room visits in Maricopa County, where people are getting sometimes life-threatening burns from falling on the ground. Because right? on a hot day, you gotta think, asphalt can actually be 40 to 60 degrees hotter than the air. Meaning in certain parts of Arizona, there have been asphalt temperatures as high as 180 degrees. With the director of burn services at Arizona Burn Center even telling CNN at one point that all 45 beds in the center are full, and a third of the patients were getting their burns from just falling on the ground. With there also being burn patients in the ICU, and half of which got those burns from falling. And so with all this, you saw Sandy Barr, the director of the Sierra Club's Grand Canyon chapter, tying all this to climate change and telling Arizona families. What we're seeing now is not normal. This is, this is more intense than we've ever seen. At what point does Phoenix actually become uninhabitable? Uh, if if we don't take uh, strong actions and take strong actions now. And then when you go across the country, you look to South Florida, water temperatures have gone as high as 101.1 degrees Fahrenheit. And well, that's a preliminary figure. If it's verified, that could be the hottest ocean temperature ever recorded globally. And that hot water, it does a lot more than just ruin a beach day, right? It can seriously damage coral reefs in the area. It can also fuel hurricanes. Then when you look at national parks throughout the United States, heat-related deaths are on the rise. With those tragedies happening at Big Bend, the Grand Canyon, and Death Valley. We've also seen horrifying scenes of wildfires throughout 
throughout Greece. Reports saying those fires have been worsened by the extreme heat. The climate crisis minister also saying that during a 12-day period in late July, the Greek fire service battled over 500 fires, doing so in severe heat. Then you hop over to China, where in July, heat records were shattered. I mean, one town hit a high of 126 degrees, the hottest ever recorded in the country. And so you take all of this, and it's not surprising to see scientists, I mean, they've they've continually done so, but sounding the alarms, warning that much of these extreme disasters and ultra-hot temperatures are the direct results of climate change. And a report published by World Weather Attribution at the end of the month saying that this heat would have been virtually impossible to occur in the U.S. and Mexico region in southern Europe if humans had not warmed the planet by burning fossil fuels. And the report adding that not only are these events no longer rare, but if we do not intervene, they will just become more and more frequent. Also with this, we've seen the likes of President Joe Biden taking steps to respond to the extreme heat and help people handle it, saying during a press conference, Even those places that are used to extreme heat have never seen it as hot as it is now for as long as it's been. Even those who deny that we're in the midst of a climate crisis can't deny the impact of extreme heat is having on Americans. And with this, he directed the Department of Labor to issue a hazard alert to affirm the heat-related protections workers have. With that, reportedly marking the first time the department has used a hazard alert to address extreme heat, which will notably allow them to ramp up enforcement of heat safety violations in sectors that are especially vulnerable, like construction and agriculture. With Biden also highlighting funds have been allocated for areas impacted by drought to store water, as well as money to improve weather forecasts so communities have more time to prepare for heat waves. Though many, many activists just do not think that this is enough. Right, given all the catastrophes that we've talked about, all the warnings from scientists, many fear that this is just a band-aid fix to an urgent and growing problem. Which is why you have one activist telling NPR that real relief won't come until Biden confronts the culprit of deadly fossil fuels. But with all of that said, as we deal with this current and new reality, what's your experience been so far? Right, we just talked about a few here, but that's one of the benefits of so many people watching this show. A lot of people can share their story. And that is where today's daily dive into the news is going to end. But do not worry, because not only for more news you need to know, do I have you covered here, you can click or tap or go into the description for those links. Just remember, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love your faces and I'll see you right back here on Sunday.